Good morning, Europe. Welcome to the program. Our top stories for you this hour. Search for survivors. Rescuers are going from house to house and street to street after wildfires kill at least 80 people in Greece. There is no much hope for uh, alive people. Unfortunately. And our team in the Cube, our social media news desk, have also been following the story closely. As tributes have been paid on social media to some of the victims, including an accomplished chef and a man on his honeymoon. Shifting gears, straight war rhetoric is taken down a notch as the EU Jean-Claude Juncker and Donald Trump agree to work towards zero tariffs. Khan in the lead. Early results in Pakistan show former cricketer and opposition figure Imran Khan in the lead to become prime minister amid allegations of vote rigging. And life on Mars. Scientists have found evidence of a huge reservoir of liquid water buried under a slab of ice, raising the prospect of life on the red planet. Thank you for starting your morning with us. Our top story, Greek authorities are beginning the bleak task of identifying those who lost their lives in the worst wildfires in recent history. At least uh, 81 people died and an unknown number are missing. Officials are investigating whether arson could be to blame. Eamon Ogana spoke to rescue workers in the Athens region. A warning, though, his report does contain images of people's injuries. The blaze may be over but there is still much work to be done. Following one of Greece's deadliest recorded fires, rescue workers combed through the seaside resort of Mati, looking for the missing, the injured, and the dead. They search field by field, street by street, house by house. There is a lot of teams around this area that they, from uh, the Hellenic Red Cross that they uh, trying to locate uh, missing persons and rescue whoever is in need. A rescue team finds an injured woman inside her home. She had been unable to travel by herself to the hospital. Her feet have been burned, making it impossible for her to walk. Rescue teams have been working around the clock under difficult circumstances and in soaring temperatures. She is one of the lucky ones. Residents say around 40 people remain missing. Their chances of survival grow dimmer by the hour. There is no much hope for uh, alive people. Unfortunately. Neighbors say a family of five are missing from this house. The rescuers search inside. There is no sign of them. Just the charred remains of a family's home, devastated by fire. Residents return to their smoldering homes. Many carrying extraordinary stories of survival. My mom called me, I was nothing at that point, and she's like, we're burning, we're burning alive. And nobody was here, nothing. Um, so I left Athens, everybody warned me that I cannot get through. There's no way, because they blocked all the streets, fire was so fast. Uh, and I was with my wife and kid, you know, Eva, in the car. And I said, I gotta go. I mean, my parents are burning. Whatever happens, happens. I made it here. At that moment, this house, my house, was burning like inferno. The flames were so high, and, and by some miracle, my parents were alive. Inside, my father is disabled, he cannot walk. Um, I took him and uh, put him in the car, and then straight up, I went up and saved my dogs. But for the missing of Matty, Fire was not the only danger they faced that night. There is also a lot of uh, uh, search and rescue teams uh, from the sea. They try to find and locate people from the sea because there is also a lot of people missing uh, in, the, in the coast. That was Eamon Ogana reporting there, and he is joining me now from Mati in the Athens region. Eamon, I mean, you were there in one of the most uh, affected, where most of the fatalities uh, were. And one of the local mayors, in fact, said that 98% of uh, Mati right now was destroyed. So, 
tell us what you're seeing and what the feeling is at the moment there. I'd say the 98% figure is a little bit too high. It's probably more realistically about 60 or 70%. But there's no question that Matty has been irreparably damaged. It's perhaps changed forever. One resident I spoke to said Matty as a settlement has been wiped off the map. And the head of the Red Cross here said uh, around 2,500 homes have been damaged in the area. Uh, the mood here, the feeling here, well, obviously, it's very somber. People have returned to their smoldering homes to take stock of what they've lost. In some cases, that's relatives and friends. In others, it's homes, cars, all their possessions, and a real feeling of tragedy here. But it's not all tragedy. What's been encouraging has been there's been signs of real solidarity and mobilization amongst people to support one another. On almost every street, you find volunteers giving out food, medicine, water, the hospitals have been turning people away because too many people have been showing up to donate blood uh, for the victims. So at the same time that there's a real sense of tragedy here, people have been coming together. A lot of the volunteers who are working here, the rescue teams working here, are volunteers, people searching for some of the missing, which is obviously the biggest concern here. Around 40 people are still thought to be missing out there. Uh, and residents and volunteers are searching houses and fields looking for those who are still out there. Yeah, Eamon, just quickly, I mean, one of the firefighters you, you spoke to, the rescuers you spoke to, said that he wasn't very hopeful. What about the, the locals? Is there a hope for them uh, to find the missing loved ones? Of course there's hope. For if you have a loved one missing, you want to find, find them alive and in one piece. But the reality is, as time goes on, it's unlikely that, that these missing people are going to survive. And so I think it's possible that the numbers of dead may, may rise even further and perhaps top 100. All right, thank you for that. Uh, Eamon Ogana reporting there from Mati. Thanks. Well, our Athens Bureau has also been following the situation closely. Euronews journalist Faye Dulgari joins me now live also from Mati. Faye, you know, we have the state of emergency. It's been declared in the Attica region. Can you just bring us up to speed with the latest? Yes. As you said, the death toll rose to 81. Uh, rescue teams continue the effort to find dozens of people dozens that remain missing. According to the, one of the mayors of the, the area, the death toll could climb to a three-digit figure. Eleven people remain hospitalized in a critical condition, and we still don't have an exact number for the missing uh, people. Uh, uh, the important thing that happened yesterday is that the government uh, spokesperson announced a package of relief measures for fire victims, uh, including uh, 5,000 euros for impacted families and 8,000 euros for impacted businesses. All the fires uh, now around uh, the area are under control, but uh, heavy forces of the fire department remain in the area in case uh, something happens. Uh, the weather forecast, uh, though, is good because uh, it is expected to rain uh, in uh... uh, Faye the next time. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, w one of the other things, I'm just wondering if we still have her. I think we've lost her. That's uh, that's a shame. Well, that was uh, Faye Dulcary from our Athens Bureau over there. They're also closely following uh, the, uh, the situation on the ground from Mati. I think I believe we just got her. Can we go back to her for just uh, one more question? Faye, um, I'd like to ask you about the, uh, the resources because we see a lot of the devastation. It is quite a lot uh, to, to handle for the rescue services. How are the resources like? Is it, is it enough? You have to know that the last seven or eight years, the years of austerity in Greece, we have been speaking to fire, to fire department, to firefighters, to the unions, to be exact, of the to the unionists of the fire fight firemen uh, every year in the beginning of the fire season. And they all say the same thing during mostly May. You have to pray that this summer we don't have fires because the shortages are huge. Some people were telling us they didn't have enough uh, money to put gas in their trucks. They didn't have money to buy masks for the firemen. So as you understand, the austerity, there's so many years of austerity in Greece, they have affected almost all aspects of life. All right, thank you for that. Again, Faye Dulcari there reporting from Mati. Well, as uh, the number of dead continues to rise, as uh, reporters have been uh, saying, there have been a lot of messages, tributes, messages of support on social media. Um, Alex and the Cube team have been following this side of the story. Alex. 
Tessa, as we start to learn more about the people caught up in the fire, we're starting to get the first confirmed names and details of the victims. Uh, and yesterday we brought you some video from um, somebody who at that time we were saying was missing. Well, and sadly now he's been confirmed as dead, and that is uh, Panis Kokonidis here. He was a Greek chef. Uh, he has died alongside uh, his mother, his wife, uh, and his uh, two children. That's uh, according to reports. Uh, Panis was a chef in Greece, and this was a statement released by the Chefs uh, Club of Greece in which, uh, talking about um, Panis Kokonidis, they called him a wonderful family man, an excellent professional. And just this photograph here, perhaps, it, it shows you some of his work. He was known for his work and he posted a lot of his dishes. We spoke to a colleague of his and in the cube she told us chocolate, as you can see here, was one of his favourite uh, foods to work with. And this is obviously one of his... Uh, one example of his work and um, a lot of people pouring in messages uh, of support and condolence um, to Panis here, including uh, this video here from uh, colleagues of his chefs, fellow chefs, sharing uh, tributes to a professional man, a family man. Um, perhaps a message that really uh, caught us this morning is this one here, which says that uh, now, Panis, you will be cooking with the angels. And I think that's a real sense that along among his colleagues, as Real sadness that has been lost. He was respected for his work um, and now a lot of tributes being paid. Also, his personal Facebook page has been changed to a memorial page on Facebook, a sign that um, the person who owned that account is, uh, has, has died. Uh, there's also uh, an Irish uh, newlywed, um, Brian, here. He'd married Zoe, his wife, a week ago today. They were on honeymoon uh, in Mati and the Irish ambassador to Greece uh, confirming to the Irish state broadcaster that Brian was indeed killed in those fires, that his wife, Zoe, though, is in hospital and is expected to make a recovery. Tributes pouring into Brian um, uh, from a across Ireland. I just want to bring you one here that really perhaps sums who up who he was. He was a volunteer rider for uh, Blood Bikes East. These, uh, these volunteers transport blood and medical supplies between clinics and hospitals. Here, you can see the length of the post. It's been shared hundreds of times with thousands of reactions uh, as people as people pay their tributes to Brian and remember a man who volunteered to help people in his local community, just some of the victims of this fire. Tessa. Indeed, and as time goes by, we'll know more about uh, the other victims as well. Thank you for that, to Alex and the CUBE team. And still to come for you on Good Morning Europe, there is a deal to make a deal. America has agreed to work towards uh, lowering trade barriers with the EU to avoid a trade war, well, for now at least. And uh, could there be life on Mars? Well, water has been found on the red planet for the first time. We'll have more on all those after the break. Your top story in Good Morning Europe. Search efforts are intensifying in Greece as rescuers go from house to house and street to street after wildfires killed more than 80 people. After months of tension, Donald Trump and Jean-Claude Juncker have agreed to work towards abolishing tariffs between the U.S. and the EU, seemingly avoiding a full-scale trade war. Well, both sides had already slapped tariffs on billions of euros worth of imports after Trump put levies on EU steel and aluminium earlier this year. Well, the surprise announcement came after a two-hour meeting between the two leaders at the White House. Your news' is Evelyn Laverick has the report. A new phase in their relationship. U.S. President Donald Trump and EU Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker have pulled back from a transatlantic trade war after talks in Washington. But initially, the omens weren't good for a happy ending. Over the years, the United States has been losing hundreds of billions of dollars with the European Union, and we just want it to be a level playing field. We are close uh, partners, allies, not enemies. We have to work together. A timely reminder, and what a difference. The two sometimes maverick negotiators later emerged pledging to work together towards lowering trade barriers. We agreed today, first of all, to work together towards zero tariffs, zero non-tariff barriers, and zero subsidies on non-auto industrial goods. Thank you. Thank you. We agreed to establish a dialogue on standards. As far as agriculture is concerned, the European Union can import more so soybeans from the US and it will be done. 
The promises diffuse what had threatened to become an all-out trade war fueled by tariffs set by Trump on European steel and aluminium exports and threats to expand the tariffs to cars. Trump appears to have given ground on that threat, possibly in return for the EU easing problems for US farmers who were searching for fresh markets after China slammed on a 25% duty. Both leaders gave the impression they felt progress had been made, and Donald Trump, far from repeating his opinion that Europe was a foe, tweeted that the transatlantic love affair is back on. Evelyn Laverick, Euronews. Well, while the deal has diffused tensions for now, there was scant detail of when and how agreements will be reached. Well, Brian Carter, our correspondent, joins us now live from Brussels. Brian, it sounds good in general, but we don't really know that much about it, do we? Exactly. At the moment, these are only declarations. We'll have to wait and see whether they materialize into actual commitments uh, on paper. We know that, as you heard, Donald Trump said that he would reassess uh, the current tariffs on steel and aluminum and hold off on further tariffs on other EU uh, goods. In exchange, the EU said that it would buy more soybeans and try to improve the facilities to receive liquefied natural gas uh, from the U.S. But the current tariffs uh, still hold the tariffs on steel, aluminum, as well as the as as well as the EU tariffs on different American products like bourbon or Harley Davidson. The biggest fear on the part of the EU is that the Donald Trump would actually uh, pursue uh, this uh, threat to increase the tariffs on EU cars from 3 to 25 percent. And that would have had a huge impact in Europe, much uh, higher than the impact of the steel and aluminum tariffs, because in Germany alone, 800,000 people depend on the car industry. So that's the thing with a global globalized economy and this uh, trans uh, transatlantic trade between the U.S. and the EU, any change in, uh, in policy, any change in tariffs can have uh, ripple effects uh, in the other uh, side of the uh, Atlantic. And that's why uh, this week I went to the port of Antwerp, which is about 45 minutes away from Brussels, to speak with the people there to see how they feel about the current tariffs on steel. Take a look. The port of Antwerp is one of the largest ports in Europe. Millions of tons of cargo transit here each year, and the first trading partner is by far the United States. Half of all EU steel exports to the U.S. are shipped from these docks. But according to Wim Dillon, a port manager, these tariffs have had so far unexpected consequences. Quite surprisingly, perhaps, uh, we have exported more steel than in the, uh, in the first six months of this year than we did in the first six months of last year. Uh, but I think that has to do uh, a lot with uh, companies anticipating on what was going to come and uh, um, filling their stocks uh, in the US. But uh, if this would last for a long time, then I think uh, it will uh, become very negative indeed. Thousands of tons of steel coming from all over Europe are stored in the port of Antwerp, waiting for a ship to carry them to the US. According to port authorities, Antwerp has gained an expertise in handling high-end products, which makes it an ideal partner for American industries. So what you can see here is our uh, newest warehouse where uh, we are storing the, the coils going to U.S., Canada and Mexican market. Uh, we are, you know, at this terminal we are handling here about a million or over a million tons a year, uh, all for those destinations. This ship docks in Antwerp for four or five days, time for more than 100,000 tons of coil to be loaded. It will then set sail for the United States. It's a hard job, but dock workers are very often proud of their work, even though their livelihoods depend on the upheavals of global trade. So on a daily basis, they're working here uh, between 150 and 400 people, directly handling the steel products to the U.S. Uh, and, you know, like uh, with all those kind of uh, import duties or, you know, hamperings like we, we might call it here locally, uh, yeah, that, that might affect those guys, that might affect those people and those families. Antwerp stock workers are not the only ones closely observing the trade negotiations between the U.S. and the EU. According to a steel sector representative, 20,000 jobs across Europe directly depend on steel exports to the U.S.
And the fact that the uh, current tariffs on steel and aluminum are maintained is seen by some in the EU as a failure. But when you see the uh, tone that was uh, heard here in the last few weeks and the escalating tensions between the U.S. and the EU, the declaration by Donald Trump and Jean-Claude Juncker is really a sharp departure from this. So you can expect a lot of discussions on trade in the coming weeks, in the coming months. Some here in Brussels are already talking about perhaps bringing back from the ashes the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment partnership which was one of the uh, trade deals that was uh, negotiating during the uh, negotiated during the Obama years but that never came uh, to fruition but this if it happens will still take many years to negotiate and in the meantime you'll have many election cycles so things can of course always change all right thanks for that uh, Brian Carter they reporting from Brussels thank you well, as part of Juncker and Trump's negotiations last night, the two sides agreed to reform World Trade Organization rules. And here to explain the significance of this is former WTO Director General Pascal Lamy, who joins us now from Paris. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Lamy, for joining us on the program. But first of all, I'd like to know what your analysis is of uh, Donald Trump first having those the tough talk, tough rhetoric, and now he seems to be stepping back. Why do you think he's doing this? Well, I think you're right. It's... Uh... Pretty surprising uh, U-turn uh, from uh, Mr. Trump. I think we should uh, get used to that. Uh, what they've agreed uh, was unexpected. It's a sort of ceasefire uh, and a start of a new negotiation uh, with a bilateral leg, which is uh, reducing transatlantic obstacle to trade on the one side. And that's true. It looks like bits and pieces of the uh, previous uh, uh, TTIP, the Transatlantic Investment and Trade Partnership, although in bits and pieces. And more importantly, as you just noticed, an agreement between US and EU uh, to work in the WTO, i.e. in the multilateral framework, in order to strengthen uh, WTO disciplines, uh, most of which uh, being about uh, uh, subsidies in China. So it's a sort of triangular strategy from the European Union. Why is that, though? Why, why, why is the focus now on reforming the WTO? Will it be featuring more prominently in, in future, possibly uh, uh, resolving trade dis disputes? Because I think uh, uh, with all the noise and the excesses of Mr. Trump, uh, there's one point on which I think everybody agrees he was right, which is that the existing WTO rules need to be improved in order, in order uh, to discipline more some Chinese practices, notably in the area of subsidization. And let's remember that before going to Washington this week, Juncker went to Beijing last week and came from Beijing with an agreement by the Chinese that some of the WTO rules should be renegotiated. So uh, Juncker did not come uh, to Washington empty-handed. Uh, he didn't come with EU concessions, but he came with the result of the discussions with the Chinese. And the EU is, and that's the way to understand it, is siding uh, with the US in order to put pressure on China and is siding with China in order to put pressure on the US. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, former World Trade Organization Director General uh, Pascal Lamy. Thank you. And still to come on Good Morning Europe, polls have closed in Pakistan's election and tens of millions of people have cast their vote. We'll find out who's tip for victory. And over in the queue. We have the story as a viral video of a student on a plane protesting against um, deporting an asylum seeker goes around the Internet. We'll have the story after a short break. You're watching Good Morning Europe. Welcome back to the program. Now, early polls in Pakistan's general election show cricketer turned politician Imran Khan's party pulling ahead. Well, Shabazz Sharif, leader of the incumbent party and Khan's main rival, called voting irregularities clear rigging. The entire campaign has been marred by violence and allegations of military coercion. As polling opened yesterday, 31 people were killed by a suicide bomber. And with us now live from Lahore is NBC's Waj Khan. Uh, Waj, uh, good to see you there. So, look, we're, we're hearing allegations of vote rigging, military uh, coercion, as well as technical failures. Uh, could, these, could this potentially spell trouble for, you know, when the results come out? 
There was trouble before this election even started. There was controversy uh, for months in the build-up to the elections. I remember that uh, Khan's main rival was not Shabazz Sharif, the man you just showed, but his elder brother, Nawaz Sharif, three-time prime minister. Khan and his lawyers and his lawyers' movement uh, essentially made sure that Nawaz Sharif sees the inside of a jail cell. Uh, that was a pretty big deal and pretty controversial. It split the country in half, polarized the polity. And then on polling day, there was a bombing, 30 people killed. Um, then during polling day, there was allegations from the incumbents that uh, the, uh, the, sense the entire process is too slow. A lot of people won't be allowed to vote. And then came allegations of rigging, uh, administrative, clerical allegations, nothing serious or systemic, but again, uh, weak in the larger picture because no evidence was found either on social media, shared on mainstream media, presented uh, uh, by the incumbent Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz, which held an emergency a midnight press conference. Even though we're still relying on exit polls and the official results have been delayed because of those allegations and recounting is being done in certain constituencies, it's rather clear. The 64-year-old former playboy cricketer At Imran Wash Khan has managed to shred Pakistan's two-party-based dynasty political system. Indeed. And it's this, is, this, is, is, this is the second uh, uh, civilian transfer of power. Just very, very quickly. I mean, whoever is the winner, can you just tell us the biggest problem that they will have to deal with? It's not just the, uh, the second consecutive, um, the third consecutive election. It is the second, it is a, a two-time transfer of power uninterrupted. Khan's main concerns, if he takes over, uh, will be, of course, uh, his own rather controversial policies on the war on terror. He's been known to be pro-Taliban. He's recently taken a U-turn on that. His Afghanistan policy, his policy right. with the Americans, with the Indians, etc. Foreign policy-wise, Khan, we know very little about Imran Khan. However, internally, Pakistan's going through a yeah. serious power crisis, a serious water crisis, a, a serious lot on balance display, of payments, for sure. and, and unemployment. Indeed, a uh, really, a lot of problems he has to do. Thank you for that. NBC's uh, Waj Khan talking to us there from Lahore. Thank you. Now, firefighters in London are tackling a blaze on the fifth floor of a block of flats. Fifteen fire engines and around 100 firefighters are at the site in northwest London. Around 50 people had to flee the block of flats after the fire started around 1 a.m. Residents affected by the fire have been offered shelter by local pubs and businesses. Now, over 100 people remain missing in Laos after the collapse of a dam on Monday. More than 6,000 people lost their homes in the deluge, with seven villages becoming entirely submerged. Rescue teams from China and Thailand are continuing the evacuation of survivors. Now, the bodies of soldiers killed in the Korean War are expected to be returned to the U.S. on Friday. Repatriation of remains from North Korea was one of the agreements made between U.S. President Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un when they met in June. The planned transfer will coincide with the 65th anniversary of the armistice between the two countries. We have a lot more coming your way, including more from Greece. We'll be talking to a fireman about what it was like to battle that devastating blaze. Plus, we'll bring you all the reaction from this uh, student activist in Sweden who tried to prevent the deportation of an Afghan asylum seeker by refusing to sit on a plane until he was removed from that aircraft. Now, scientists have also discovered liquid water on Mars. Does that mean there's life on the Red Planet? Well, we'd like to find out, don't we? But first, we'll leave you with no comment of, of today from California where they're also battling wildfires. Some 60 fires broke out in the U.S. just this week alone. Ready, get ready. Look at that. So get back over a little bit this way, right there. Top stories on Good Morning Europe. Search for survivors. Rescuers are going from house to house and street to street after wildfires kill at least 80 people in Greece. Shifting gears, trade war rhetoric has taken down a notch as the EU's Jean-Claude Juncker and Donald Trump agree to, war to work towards zero tariffs. And life on Mars. Scientists have found evidence of a huge reservoir of liquid water buried under a slab of ice, raising the prospect of life on the red planet. 
Going back to our top story, after the worst wildfires in recent history, Greek authorities are beginning the bleak task of identifying those who lost their lives. Well, efforts are underway to find the dozens of people still missing, and one local mayor said the number of dead could rise to over 100 from the current figure of at least 81. The government has announced thousands of euros in aid for families and businesses impacted by the disaster. Firefighters are still monitoring the situation, but rain is forecast, which rescuers hope will bring some welcome relief from the tinder dry conditions. Officials are investigating whether the whether arson could be to blame. Now Vasilis Kazukas, a representative for the Greek Federation of Professional Firefighters, is joining us now from Athens. Uh, thank you, Vasilis, uh, for joining us uh, today. Now we saw harrowing images and we've heard those harrowing stories. Can you tell us what your experience was like battling that blaze and finding survivors and, and some of the dead? Uh, we believe now it's uh, not the time to describe uh, stories. We focus on the human side and uh, all uh, everything uh, that is needed from now on to reduce the impact mitigation of this catastrophe. And what are the next steps in order to not have in the future situations like this? So what it's is ahead time. for you? Sorry, for go me, ahead. For me, it's, it's time now to evaluate the basis of uh, the mechanism uh, for forest fire protection. It was a very difficult fire. It was a very difficult fire. Uh, it was a massive fire with uh, high winds. Uh, even the direction of the wind make uh, the whole operation more difficult because the area have many uh, dead end roads and all this uh, at the end uh, made a big catastrophe a tragedy for the greek nation which shows in every way the, sol the solidarity to the victims and their families yeah, so Vasilis, you know, today we were talking about the continuing rescue efforts. Um, and so looking ahead, what do you still have to do uh, after, you know, the, the, the rescue op operations uh, uh, end? There's a big, uh, uh, there's still a big operation in progress in order to find every victim. And we will not finish until we find every missing person. That is our primary goal. After this, we will discuss what went wrong, uh, what we could do to have better results, right. if, we could, if, we, if we could do something to have better results, and how we Vasilis will... uh, Kazukas, thank you. Uh, it, it is a, a, a big effort for, for the, uh, all of you there rescuing uh, people. Thank you very much for joining us on the program. Vasilis Kazukas from the Greek Federation of Professional Firefighters. Thanks. Now, hundreds of people uh, are dead after a series of coordinated attacks in the southern province of Suweda in Syria. So-called Islamic State have claimed responsibility for the attacks in the provincial capital and surrounding villages. The violence sparked fighting between Syrian troops, local armed groups and ISIS militants later in the day. Well, joining me to tell us more is our correspondent, Alistair Sanford. Uh, Alistair, first of all, can you just bring us up to speed with, with the latest about this particular attack? Yes, well, this was the <clears throat> deadliest attack by the so-called Islamic state in Syria for years and it's the worst in this region throughout the whole of the the civil war um, Suweda is a largely government held area uh, that's been spared the worst of the violence until now but this was a, a coordinated attack by ISIL that resulted in a day of bloodshed several villages were stormed at once it seems in the early hours of Wednesday uh, reports speak of residents being taken by surprise some of them unwittingly opening their doors to their attackers uh, the reports say that whole families were then were then slaughtered um, that dozens of women and children were, were abducted and taken away to uh, to the militants hideouts and it brought clashes between pro-government fighters uh, on the one side with the residents against the militants meanwhile in the provincial capital itself Suweda, uh, there were two suicide blasts including 
um, a motorbike bombing on a vegetable market. We've been seeing some of the pictures. Um, the state media says that others were thwarted as well. Uh, as for the casualties, the details are surprisingly precise. Uh, regional authorities speaking of 215 dead and almost that number injured. Those numbers backed up by independent monitors. Um, Pro-government forces did regroup and they took control. The state governor says that um, uh, the situation is secure and calm. But clearly it's been a day of carnage and typical tactics by ISIL who did claim responsibility. Yeah, let's just look at the bigger picture. Uh, can we can you just tell us where we are in general with this uh, effort against uh, ISIS in the region? <clears throat> ISIL has been driven from the vast majority of its territory in Syria and Iraq. Uh, separate campaigns by the Syrian government forces backed by the Russians and uh, also the US-led coalition. Most recently we've seen um, Assad's forces crushing the remaining rebel-held areas um, in the southwestern Dera province next to Suweida, um, including one area which ISIL held near uh, the Golan Heights. Um, the UN has said that uh, the fighting has brought uh, led to tens of thousands uh, fleeing their homes. ISIL overall, it's been reduced in its capabilities. It's there in isolated pockets, but it's clearly not defeated. All right, thank you. For that, uh, Alistair Sanford, thanks. Now, there is a video that's uh, going viral. A Swedish student activist, she prevented the deportation of an Afghan man by refusing to sit on a plane until he was let out. But not everyone is praising her actions for this. Alex is bringing us both sides. Yes, sir. So 21-year-old Elian Ersson uh, boarded an aircraft and live-streamed the whole thing. Let's just watch the moment she got on the plane and started that broadcast. I'm right now at an airport, at an airplane, and there's a person getting deported to Afghanistan. Please don't take my phone, don't touch my phone. And the people here working are trying to take my phone away from me just because Shut a person down, go is home. going Shut to down. get deported to Shut Afghanistan down. where there's Shut war down. and he's Shut. going to get killed. So there's a man on board that aircraft who is going to be deported to Afghanistan and by standing up and not taking her seat, Ellen prevented the aircraft taking off. Now she was told many times to sit down by the crew and indeed a passenger as well. Just watch this uh, altercation with uh, an English sounding passenger. And you're upsetting all the people down there. What? So I don't care I'm, what you think. I'm just asking. I'm just what you, is more care. important, your no, life no. or the time? What about all these children on here? You, you are frightening. Take your phone off. Don't take my phone. Sir. Thank you. So um, an English guy just got really angry and he stole my phone, but the flight attendant was really nice and took it back for me and gave it back. So this was all live streamed and this video now has been viewed more than three and a half million times. In that clip, an English man, well, English sounding man trying to take the phone out of Ellen's hands. Now, eventually, by the end, people were standing up, other people, whether to support her or just to see what was going on. But the effect was the same and the man was taken off the aircraft. The uh, asylum seeker deported, uh, taken off the aircraft and not deported. And this is the moment that Ellen broke down when she was applauded by other passengers on the plane. <laughs> They're taking his bags out, so I'm just waiting for the flight attendant to make me shit say that that is okay for me to go out the back of the plane to go out. Hello. So let's give you a bit of context to this. Ellen Erson is a 21-year-old student activist, and we in the Cube here, we've reached out to the group she belongs to who oppose Sweden's policy, the policy of the government, of deporting asylum seekers back to Afghanistan. Sweden uh, insists that Afghanistan is a safe country. Well, activists uh, like Ellen disagree, and they do not want the government to keep on with that policy. This is a hot topic in Sweden ahead of an election, the general election, in September. Now, Ellen's group bought a ticket on that flight. They confirmed this to us. They bought that ticket. So this was an arranged protest um, to be on that aircraft to make sure uh, that the man on board would not be deported. There's been a real mix of uh, people, a lot of support uh, users like Eva Marie Larsson here saying that you are so brave, Erin. Other people, though, pointing out that Sweden has systems, to quote Richard here, is a user in Sweden on Facebook. We can't take care of everyone. Sit down is his message there. So it's unclear what actually has now happened to the man who was not deported on that flight, but also questions about what will happen next to uh, Ellen, who could be facing jail time or even a fine. You can let us know your thoughts on this story using hashtag the Cube. Another interesting debate there. Thank you for that, uh, Alex and the Cube team.
And still to come for you on the program, could there be life on Mars? Well, water has been found on the red planet for the first time, but does that increase the probability of finding life there? Well, we'll tell you. We'll be back after a short break. Your top story in Good Morning Europe. Search efforts are intensifying in Greece as rescuers go from house to house and street to street after wildfires kill at least 80 people. Japan have executed the final six members of a doomsday call to carry out a deadly sarin attack on the Tokyo subway in 1995. The attacks that left 13 dead and injured more than 6,000 were part of a series of crimes by the group. All 13 members of the cult who were on death row have now been executed. Now, shares in the social media giant Facebook have tumbled by over 20 percent after the website's revenue and user growth fell far short of investor expectations. The platform has had a tough year amid privacy scandals involving Cambridge Analytica and other app developers. The number of users of the website also fell sharply within the EU amid tightening regulations of user privacy. Well, for the first time, researchers say they have found conclusive evidence of water on Mars. Well, what is believed to be a huge underground lake was discovered after three years of data collection by the European Space Agency's Mars Express spacecraft. The discovery once again questions the probability of life on the Red Planet. And joining me to tell us more about this amazing discovery is Jeremy Wilkes, our science correspondent. Well, this is exciting, Jeremy. It's a huge discovery. So what does it mean, actually? This is extremely exciting. And I was just uh, absolutely stunned to see this because we see these kinds of stories about, you know, water and sometimes it's something maybe briny, a few little signs on the surface. This time, it's certain they're 100% sure. I was talking to some of the Italian researchers involved with this last night when the news came out. They're 100% sure down about one and a half kilometers below the, the, the south pole of Mars. There's this lake probably about 20 kilometers wide. In terms of depth, they're not sure because they're using radar, so they can't really see the depth. They're, they're sure it's at least a meter. It could be up to a, a kilometer deep. It's very cold down there. Uh, we're talking about a, at least um, warmest, perhaps, minus 10, uh, minus 30. It's very briny, salty, but it is water. And it was interesting, we were talking before the show that you were saying that, in fact, they sat on this information for years. And uh, what's next now, now that we know that there is actually liquid water what, there? What's next? Well, for, from their point of view, they're going to carry on using that instrument and trying to find more of these lakes. They're pretty sure that there are other lakes in that same area. So this isn't just an isolated case. We know there's water on Mars, and we've known that for a long time, but it's been you know, ice or there's a bit of water vapor there. Um, the other thing that's going to happen is the um, European Space Agency and the Russian Space Agency Roscosmos are going to send the ExoMars rover in 2020 and that's going to go to the surface and drill. It's not going to drill down very far, about two meters. It's going to look for life um, directly just below the surface where the radiation environment is a bit more favorable and there it's going to be looking for life. Maybe they'll find something. This is certainly going to be encouraging speculation because it's such exciting news. This is really, really significant. Oh no, so we don't have an answer science. yet. We don't I know don't yet. have an answer for you yet, but I really hope I'm, I'm back here in, I don't know, in a couple of years' time confirming it to you. But this is really exciting news that we've got here. All right. Thank you for that, uh, Jeremy Wilkes, our space correspondent. Thank you. Now, uh, coming up for you on the program, we have a protest. Uh, we'll tell you why 150,000 people are protesting. They've signed a petition to stop the release of a new Netflix show. But first, let's take a short break. You're watching Good Morning Europe. Welcome back to the program. Now, our next story, the TV and movie sharing streaming platform Netflix. It's come under fire for preparing to release a show that some people say promotes fat shaming. Well, Alex has been following this story. Alex? It's got you talking. It's got a lot of you signing a petition as well. Let's just bring up an online petition to stop Netflix releasing this new program. As of this morning, we can see here the sign count going over 161,000 people. They want Netflix not to release a show in which the main character loses weight over the summer and then seeks to take revenge on the bullies. The idea here is she's transformed from someone not seen as conventionally good looking to someone seen as good looking. She gets attention and now she's on uh, the quest for revenge. People saying, well, this is clearly sending the wrong message to girls. In order to get attention and feel good about yourselves, you've got to lose weight. Otherwise, you're not attractive. They call this fat shame. 
shaming. And people here in a really long post on change.org, now supported by over 160,000 of you, uh, want this show not to be released. A lot of comments on this. Let's just bring up this one by Sarah. Stay far away from the Netflix show if you're recovering from an eating disorder. The suggestion here that it could help, it could promote um, these sort of mental health concerns. Other people as well. Savannah says, this is trash. Netflix, I expected a company that prided itself on changing the faces in the, in the entertainment and the uh, entertainment industry and about inclusivity to not be anywhere near this. But other people saying, look, it's a dark comedy. Let's bring up this comment from Lauren. It's a dark comedy. Get over yourselves. You don't have to watch it. It's not fat shaming. What do you think? Should you sign? Should we sign? Should Netflix stop the release of the show? You can let us know using hashtag the cube. And thank you for joining us on Good Morning Europe. Do stay with Euronews for all of your top stories. In the meantime, we'll leave you with today's no comment from the Kornati Archipelago in Croatia, where researchers have discovered a pod of 50 short-beaked common dolphins, a rare find as the species is close to extinction in the Mediterranean.